What have we here? It looks like one of those old-timey music boxes with a metal comb. But what if I told you that this gadget could be a gateway for a generation of future chemists? More about this gizmo, plus a beverage fresh from the forest, are coming up in this episode of Speaking of Chemistry. I'm Sophia Kai. Lauren Wolf is on vacation. Our first story is about maple water. It's marketed as a health drink, and it's coming soon to a store near you. Carmen Drawl has more on the story. Thanks, Sophia. Five years ago, no one would have been calling maple water the next big thing. But that was before the multi-million dollar industry that is coconut water. Which, by the way, I can't stand the taste of. Never tried it, but apparently some people agree with you. Anyway, maple water producers are touting the local food angle. Their product comes from trees in Canada and the northeastern U.S. instead of the tropics. So that's the sales pitch. What about the chemistry? Right. Maple water is just pasteurized maple sap the watery liquid you'd boil to get syrup. It has sugars, but it also contains minerals and polyphenols. For more about those, I talked with Navindra Serum. He studied these compounds in the context of pasteurization. It's necessary to pasteurize maple water because of its watery consistency. It's about 99% water, and because of that, microbes are going to grow. Pasteurization kills microbes, and Serum's lab at the University of Rhode Island has shown that pasteurization doesn't destroy maple sap's polyphenol antioxidants. Not surprising, since most of them survive the long boiling process needed to turn sap into syrup. But so what? How healthy is water with antioxidants compared to plain old water? Here's what Serum thinks the science says. Although humans are consuming antioxidants, what happens when these compounds get into the body is, is still unknown. Nevertheless, consumers are very interested in, in consuming natural, minimally processed beverages which contain, contain antioxidants. So I think as a field, you know, as we move forward, you know, we're still trying to understand, but still consumers, you know, they're going to do what they're going to do. Demands from passionate people are something you can't ignore. And that brings us to our next story. Classic chemistry sets are long gone because of worries about lawsuits and safety, but they haven't been forgotten. In fact, a major competition to reinvent the chemistry set recently announced its winners. The SPARK, or Science Play and Research Kit contest, was launched by the Society for Science and the Public with the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. You're watching footage from the second place prototype. It converts electrical activity from muscles into cues people can see or hear. Sweet! <laughs> Wait till you hear about the winner. The top prize went to the hand-cranked prototype you saw at the top of the program. It does real chemical reactions, but at a much smaller scale than kits of yore. The pin mechanism reads a punch card and uses those instructions to push fluids through the microfluidic chip. The chemistry, such as color-changing titrations, takes place inside. I really like that idea. Me too. In other chemistry kit news, the Chemical Heritage Foundation has launched an app to reproduce classic kits, explosions, and stenches in a safer virtual sense. ChemCrafter launched on April 6th. Since then, it's been downloaded from the Apple App Store over 220,000 times. CHF says most of the downloads are coming from Russia and its neighbors. College-bound kids there take at least four years of chemistry, and it just so happens to be exam season. The app was the perfect way to practice their chemistry and their English. Who knew? All right, time to wrap up with the segment we call, What's That Stuff? Take it away, Sophia. Thanks. Ever wonder how peacock feathers and CDs change colors depending on what angle you're looking at them from? Or where the vivid blue hues of bluebirds and blue morpho butterflies are born from? It's because of something called structural color, and I'm embarrassed to admit I had never heard about it before. Uh, I mean, I've never either, actually, come to think of it. So how exactly does it work? These images of microcapsules illustrate the concept. They're all made from the same core shell nanoparticles, but they're all different colors. These materials' nanostructures selectively reflect certain wavelengths of light and let other wavelengths of light through, creating the color we see. But if the material's nanostructure is rejiggered, it will reflect different wavelengths and become a different color. To get different colors, researchers just changed the thickness of the shells, which changed how much room the microcapsules had to bunch together. Scientists think this technology could be used to create full-color displays that don't need to be backlit. Wow, learned something new. 
What's next? Ford and GM are starting to glue their cars together. You might remember rivets on the side of your school bus, but structural adhesives make more durable bonds and allow automakers to replace steel with aluminum, which makes for much lighter, more fuel-efficient cars. In fact, the 2014 Cadillac CTS, which uses a combination of structural adhesives and old-school techniques, is five inches longer than the 2013 model, but a whopping 250 pounds lighter. That's a pretty big difference. And that's all the time we have for Speaking of Chemistry. You can get more details about this episode's stories on our website, cen.acs.org. Support for CNN and for the show comes from the American Chemical Society. If you like the show, react with us. Subscribe to the show on YouTube. Chat with us on Twitter with the hashtag SpeakingOfChem or by email at speakingofchem at acs.org. Thanks for watching. Until next time.